Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces here as well. Uh, I was just saying before we started, it's exactly a year ago since I last taught in here to live physical human beings, so it's very nice to, to see you all tonight. Okay, so researching the past to inform the future. I'm going to read part of my script out and then I'll add some bits, but I've got so many facts and figures I want to get across to you. I'll make sure I get all the right bits and pieces, so here it goes. The study of historic design landscapes has largely ignored 20th century uh, landscapes, and yet these young landscapes do have their own history, and they are an important part um, of our historical record and provide a sort of good social commentary. I began researching the grounds at Ripple in 2008. I was quite interested to see how the landscape that we have today had developed from the farmland. I knew that we'd come here in the 1930s, not me personally, but the, the institution had come here in the 1930s. And I was interested to see how that had developed into the landscape that we have today. I had previously used local sites such as Ingotstone Hall and Highlands Park with our students as an educational exercise to show them how you can research the site using archival material, site material, and put them together to form some landscape timeline. I, my mantra, if you like, is you can't manage a site if you don't understand the history. So it's important to understand that baseline. I then began to wonder, why are we going elsewhere? What do we have here in the college? It was college at that time. What would there be to find? So here goes a sort of snapshot of what I discovered. And it is a snapshot. There is a lot more that could be said. So I started having a look. Um, there is a wealth of material. And I have to say, in the last 12 years, a lot more has uh, come to light. So let's go back to the beginning, before the institution came here. I can see everybody reading the bit out in bold, so I won't have to do that um, for you. So, Riddle University College, as it's known today, can trace its links back to the 1890s. Now, this was a time when there was great concern over the poor technical education of the day. It was quite fragmented, and there was a, a feeling nationally that our, um, we were unable to compete with other nations, and we really needed to train up our workforce. Now, you might wonder where the whiskey bit comes in, but be patient, I'll get to that bit in just a minute. So, in 1889, there was a Technical Instruction Act, and you can see here the bit I put in bold was about really the principles of science and art, which is still very much uh, true today. So, this was um, a way in which the uh, government wanted to encourage uh, technical education to move forward, and local authorities were empowered to levy a penny tax to support technical education. But more money was needed, and it came from perhaps what you might think of as an unlikely source. It came from whiskey. This was a, a time of the temperance movement, and it was a time when uh, there was a, a really strong push to try and reduce the amount of uh, alcohol that was being consumed, and this meant that perhaps some uh, public houses would be closed, they wouldn't have their licenses renewed. And the government raised the tax on alcohol. Now that tax was supposed to compensate publicans who would not now have a business because their license hadn't been renewed. Again, people pushed back and said, no, we don't really want that. We don't want to have these publicans compensated in that way. And so the government had a pot of money that they really didn't know what to do with at that time. And so the suggestion was put forward that the money would be ring-fenced and put into technical education. So for a number of years, up until 1902, money was put into technical education across the country. Local authorities could set up schools, could set up colleges uh, to train people. And agriculture was part and parcel of that. So, in 1892, the old grammar school became vacant and the county laboratories uh, were set up there and in 1893 began to offer first, the first courses in biology and chemistry 
then in agriculture, and the science and practice of horticulture. The School of Horticulture was established by 1896, and it said that Charles Wakeley was, rec was recruited from Kew as the first horticultural practical uh, instructor. Now, I don't, I haven't yet been able to verify this. I've been told that this picture is of Charles Wakeley and his students on a practical in um, the gardens at Rainsford End. But you always know you have to always verify these facts and I can't yet. So there's a lot of anecdotes uh, around. Um, in 1903, there's a change of premises and uh, they moved to King Edward Avenue. And you can see the name change here. We've now become the Essex Anglin Institute of Agriculture. Sorry, East Anglin. Uh, Institute of Agriculture. Now I'm going to refer to it now as the Institute. All the documentation refers to it as the Institute as we move forward. So by now they were providing courses in agriculture, horticulture, dairy, and also offering gardening courses for teachers, which is quite far thinking really. And the Institute staff also undertook advisory and research work. However, by 1935, the full-time student numbers had reached the dizzy height of 100, uh, putting pressure on the accommodation in Chelmsford. At the same time, Essex County Council wished to extend their premises at County Hall and wanted to take over the site of King Edward Avenue. So these factors, together with the requirement of land for teaching agriculture, pointed to the need to find a site and to relocate. In 1935, the Agricultural Education Subcommittee was allowed by the County Council to look for an estate to centralise the Institute's activities, which were actually spread over five sites, which obviously made it quite difficult. You might actually, Henry might be wondering why this, why was there not a farm? Well, they had actually already purchased a farm, but it wasn't working out very well, and it was sold at some earlier point. So they were relying on taking students to agricultural enterprises to do their teaching. And it's really felt that we, we the institution, should have its own um, farm. Now, I particularly like this uh, diagram, as you can see. Um, the first one was just the, the plain proposal. Here you can see somebody had been scribbling all over it as to what crops were going to go where, um, and you know, beautiful annotations. And we can see that this became a working uh, document in those early years. So, um, four, uh, four farms were purchased. You'll recognise the names if you know anything of what we do. Uh, Sturgeons, Dawes, Lordship and Guys. And those names have sort of continued on um, since. So the idea was to create an estate of 550 acres and the plans were drawn up to develop an estate for purposes of instruction. The budget for the project was £100,000, which is about £6 million today, which you think is actually quite a large, uh, large sum. And the Institute report of the day states, the development of the great and important scheme is a wonderful opportunity for the Institute no effort is being spared by any one department to ensure the success of the whole enterprise. So you get the feeling that people were really behind um, this and really wanted this, this to work. We have here a picture of the design for the new institute buildings, which were approved by the Fine Arts Commission. But the original uh, design, um, which was intended as an architectural showpiece, was considered too expensive and had to be revised. Uh, another little anecdotal piece of information which I haven't yet been able to collaborate uh, uh, to corroborate. If you go around some of the uh, rooms in the main building, you'll notice it's just painted brickwork. And I've been told that that was because at the time there wasn't the money or the labour materials to actually finish some of those uh, rooms and they were going to go back and finish them off at a later date and it never happened and that's why it's just painted brickwork. As I say, that's an, uh, another anecdote. Um, so, building work began in 1938, and foundation stones for the main building were laid on the 28th of September 1938 by Mr. John Gill, Chairman of the Essex Agriculture Education Committee, and Mr. Alderman Francis Dent, JP, 
chairman of the Essex Agriculture Committee. And how do I know this? Apart from the fact it's written down, we have, if you've ever gone out and looked by the front door, the stones are there. You can only really see them in the winter months because the Parthenicis, which is another story we'll come to, of course has covered them over, but they are there. Two hostels, sorry, the, the two-storey H design accommodated teaching rooms, laboratories and offices together with the dining room, kitchen, common rooms, I think from reading it, male and female had separate common rooms, and the assembly hall with a stage for amateur dramatics. Um, and I can remember the stage being used for amateur dramatics right up until a few years ago when somebody decided to remodel that, that part, but the annual review was a, a highlight of the student calendar. I don't think it was the start, because they usually were um, on the <laughs> receiving end of the jokes there. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, two hostels were built um, for residential students, later named Dent and Gill. And you can see where their names have come from. The calendar of 1939 records that the rooms in the women's hostel, which is Dent, contained a fitted wardrobe and a wash basin, whilst the men's hostel, Gill, had fitted wardrobes only. <laughs> <laughs> I shall leave you to put that one out. Uh, all the buildings featured local facing brick um, from Mark's Tay, and the planned archway, which you can just see here. So those of you who know the main but you'll know you're driving here into this area here, and you'll notice there's um, a turning circle shown at the back of the building, not the front, which is here. You can see it's very, very different. The idea at that time, of course, there would have been no cars coming to that, that part at all. Um, so the planned archway to the uh, enclosed quadrangle didn't materialise, and today it is a car park. So we'll just go on. So um, if you go and look at the two hostels, you can see the dent sign. The gill sign seems to have disappeared. I went to check the other week, and it's not so that was the entryway, that was the idea you would go through the archway into the uh, quadrangle. Um, but today, as you know, it's now um, a car park. The aim was to move into this new accommodation in October 1939. In the meantime, temporary arrangements had to be made leaving the students without a common room and staff split over several sides. Apparently, quote, these serious inconveniences were cheerfully borne by staff and students alike. <laughs> no NSS at that time. <laughs> so, uh, staff and students moved to Riffle in January 1940 um, on what's said to be one of the coldest days um, of the year. And now the East Anglian Institute was named the Essex Institute of Agriculture. Though the courses commenced at Riffle, um, they had to be suspended due to the outbreak of war. Um, the estate and buildings were requisitioned by the War Agricultural Executive Committee. It doesn't roll off the tongue, does it? And many of the staff were uh, seconded to the war effort. The um, need for food reduction obviously meant that the laying out of the gardens had to be put on hold. And these are probably the two pictures here being the ones that people you ask about the history of Britain, almost they say the cabbages on the front lawn, um, because that's the one that people obviously. Um, have related to it and it's quite iconic. I think with it, you know, it just shows that new building, it looks quite stark um, there. The buildings were subsequently not released back to the college in full until 1948, although courses, including horticulture, did actually start again um, from 1946 here. In the war years, uh, I understand some courses were did continue, but out of houses in Chelmsford, and that's another area I've got yet to sort of follow up a bit more. However, the, the move to Ripple um, allowed the Institute to provide better, better teaching facilities and demonstrating facilities to support the courses. As soon as plans had been made to purchase the estate in 1935, arrangements were made to plant 56 acres of top fruit and soft fruit, which by 1939 would begin to yield a crop. And you can see, this is a slightly later picture, but you can quite clearly see the orchards um, from here. Sorry, I have to stand back and do this one. So there's the main building, the 
two hostels, and you can see the extent of the fruit farm up through here. <coughs> fruit was an important aspect of the Institute's work. The Institute's calendar of 1939-40 states, as a fruit growing county, Essex is well to the forefront, the fruit, being, the fruit produced being of superior quality. Market gardening drumming is also practiced on the same high level, and no county offers better facilities for a thorough insight into all phases of general and commercial horticulture. And you know that Essex um, doesn't have quite such a big fruit collection now, but um, there is a lot of interest now in old fruit varieties, and it's quite a you know, nice link to the theme of the heritage open day. The same document, the calendar of 1939, also notes features of historical interest, namely the Moses site of King John's Palace, just across the road from here, with the remains of the fish ponds and the old barn at Lordship's Farm. The intention was to use the moated site and surrounds for wild and water gardens, though this did not happen. In 1955, the reservoir was constructed in front of the moated area and the spoil taken across the road to fill an old gravel pit and the site planted with trees. So as you turn out of this building, turn right out of it, and you'll go down the road at the bottom of Foxbridge Lane, the little copse of trees is actually on made up ground. Um, and filled up. And I can, I know that because I was actually told by a person who put the spoil there. So that is a very fine fact. But it's quite interesting when you see here, um, you look across and you can see the main building and the hostels and how open the site looks um, at that time. Once the architectural style of the 1930s was forward-looking and reflected in the architecture here, garden design was still heavily influenced by past styles. According to Janet Waymark, the garden historian, the designer Christopher Tunnel condemned contemporary garden making as suffering from the burden of past history and an excess of horticulture. That's what well, we could happily debate. Certainly the newly laid out grounds of the Institute were on traditional grounds. The calendar of 1939 and 40 lists the features as extensive herbaceous and shrub borders, a formal rose garden, large scale shelter belts, collection of trees, shrubs, specimen trees, and hedge plants, heath garden, and lawns and tennis courts. The grounds were laid out with the intention of providing, my quote, an appropriate setting to, and to provide facilities for a full, full course in general horticulture. On such an open site, of course, shelter belts were essential if you were going to get anything else to establish. 11 acres of land around the main building were devoted to gardens. This meant that excellent opportunities are afforded for students to gain experience in garden layout and design and in the practical operations necessary in involving essential features and to gain experience in preliminary operations necessary in transforming a large area into garden grounds in the later maintenance and upkeep. In other words, the students were going to be very busy in creating the new grounds um, here. Some of the practical work was still continuing in the gardens at Rainsford Road and they, a lot of plant material was raised there and brought then to um, plant up in the gardens here. You can see the, um, the view down here, we'll just have a look at that because apart from this we don't, and that little bit that I just quoted, we don't have any other information on the sort of the intention of the design at that time. So we have no idea why certain things were placed um, where they were. But what we can see is here, there is a, um, this is where my memory now starts coming because I actually remember these. Um, there was a beach hedge and a large uh, line of uh, western red cedars, the Yucatan, lining what is, this is the south drive coming up here, 
that's the formal rose garden. And they provided shelter because the prevailing wind was coming this way, and so this would have been quite open. So by having the tall trees here, it gave quite a lot of shelter um, to that area. But the beach hedge was later removed, and then by the late 1990s, it was felt that the uh, western red cedars were too large and really becoming quite over dominant. Also, there was a, a move to put in a cycleway, which now exists down the side uh, of this um, South Drive. So, another student practical, a rather hefty practical here, was the felling of the western red cedars. And then, of course, now it allows that uninterrupted view all the way across um, there. And, of course, now we have other trees that have grown up in that time to create shelter. Horticultural facilities expanded in the 1950s with a glasshouse unit, grow tomatoes, cucumbers, chrysanthemums, pot plants, carnations, lettuces, and others. There was a market garden area, as shown here, a demonstration allotment area, and also display glasshouses. And if anybody's sitting and I wonder where that view is taken, I'm assuming somebody's on the roof of the Hubert Ashton building to get that view. Um, that's Wilmot. Which is still there, and the design building will be sitting there. Um, students also undertook visits to horticultural enterprises, usually on a Saturday morning. So, Saturday morning classes continued for quite, and I don't know yet at what time they stopped, um, but that was, that was part of the curriculum. Students were expected to reside on site, attend meals punctually, show satisfactory diligence in their studies, follow the rules of good conduct, and not behave in a way to discredit the institution. Um, if you carry on reading the rules, there are, it tells you what happens if you, if you do. Um, there were facilities for a range of sports, and students were expected to participate in some form of sport on a Wednesday afternoon. Special terms were available to local uh, golf, club, uh, golf club as well, so you could also play golf um, if you wish to. In 1951, an application was made for grant of arms, as you can see here, and these were presented on presentation day 1951. In 1953, the Institute celebrated its Diamond Jubilee. Obviously, during the war years, it hadn't been able to, to celebrate its golden anniversary. And here we see photographs taken on the 1st of July, um, which record the activities, which is why we have a wealth of, active, uh, wealth of photographs from that, this particular period of time. And very helpfully, on the back of each of the photographs, it actually explains who's doing what and what's going on. So a uh, very good record for us. We have gates that were presented to mark the occasion, the gates we still have. And you can see people being taken around uh, on tractors and trailers, which obviously wouldn't happen today, but it looks like it's great fun. And um, this picture is of the herbaceous border, and that's the driveway, and the other driveway will be here. Sometimes you have to look quite closely at these pictures to try and work out um, where they are. So here we have another uh, photograph from that day. So you can see the main building and the rock garden, <coughs> herbaceous borders, herbaceous border there, the um, yew hedge will be tucked in the back there, and specimen trees on the lawn. Here's a sort of similar sort of view in 1960, and then same view in, as, as best I can do it in 2007. As the scope of courses and subjects has widened over time, obviously different facilities have been needed, hence why um, the Rose Garden gave way to the, uh, the design studio. Now, if you remember earlier, I said the designs for the main building were submitted to the Fine Arts Commission, so um, quite rightly, the staff at the school very, very proud of the building of the day. So the facade of the main building was not to be spoiled by any horticultural activity and initially, apart from some seasonal bedding, little was planted in front of the main building. 
um, other than, of course, the specimen trees on the front lawn. Same view a few years later, but with the addition of a box hedge at the base here. And in those days, it was necessary to ask the principal's permission to undertake any major project in the landscape, which apparently was not always forthcoming. The principal of the day was not keen to see any plants clothing the building, but did give, the permission, did give his permission for the box hedge to be planted. John Sales, who later became garden advisor to the National Trust, was in charge of the grounds in the 1960s. He also decided to plant Austin Ivy, part of scissors, as a ground cover behind the hedge. <laughs> It is, of course, a climber with brilliant autumn colour, as you can see here. And John very kindly came uh, to talk to the students and do a tour around the grounds and told us some of the things he did. But also, you can read this about, about um, his time here in his autobiography called Fifty Shades of Green, which is a very good read, I can, I can say. And in there, he said part of his role was to learn both how to manage principals and also owners of National Trust properties. And he felt there was little to choose between them. That you, you had to be diplomatic, but he got his way, knowing, of course, what would happen to the um, climber. And, of course, what we've seen over the years, that it has indeed clothed the building, and, of course, gives us that brilliant autumn colour that everybody now associates with this building uh, in the autumn. So, say, thanks to John Sells quietly planting this ground cover that we have this. More facilities were required as student numbers continued to grow. And in 1957, a uh, new hostel, which then was later named Strut, and a dining hall was added. Um, followed by the Recreation Centre in the 1960s, named after Sir Hubert Ashton, uh, the MP. And in 1966, money was raised through subscription to fund the building of a chapel with five stained glass windows. Uh, today, this is the multi faith room. And actually, tonight, just on my way out, I just was flicking through the document for faithful, but I did. Uh, and I came across a little um, plea from Ben Harvey, the principal, who said that they were £500 short. And then, if anybody would like to make a donation towards the chapel, all money will be gratefully received. That was in 1965. The new buildings were situated around the edge of a large field. and. We understand that this was uh, used as a playing field for a period, for a period of time, um, which might have explained why we had problems establishing the plants later on, because of the treatment for the turf had lowered the pH in such a way that it made it quite hard for some other plants to establish. Um, so there's lots of things about understanding what's gone on in the past can affect what you currently do on, on the grounds. But this is a view from Strut Hostel, looking across to the dining hall. This area, of course, now is known as Central Campus Gardens, but this is how it started by the, with these buildings being uh, located here. The layout that was established at the time were really dictated by pathways uh, going from the doors of the hostel down to the central feature because everybody was coming in um, to this part here. So you can see this particular triangular layout. Um, the central um, one here were two purple hedges lining, backed, um, backing large herbaceous borders, which I can remember as a student just being full of weed, <coughs> the bind weed, it was really, really difficult. And somebody always seemed to cut in the hedge very early in the morning. Well, it seemed early when you're a student, but it probably wasn't that early. And you can see here uh, the um, open area, that's Strut Hostel there. And then this is the water. And this was a very popular colour scheme of at that, at that time, to have sort of purple trees, um, silvery grey trees, this sort of purple and grey foliage was very much something of the 70s. Um, and then you can see a view to the new dining hall. And then a picture of the, a few years later, as it was developing. In the mid-1980s, an opportunity arose to redevelop this area into its current layout, thanks to funding from Southend Borough Council. 
in recognition of the long-standing uh, training and educational links that we had with South End. The paths were lined with the birch that we can see here, and the hedges were made of yew. However, these were planted as part of a practical class, with were lots of practical classes with students, and despite every attention being paid to the preparation and planting technique, uh, 3,000 hedging plants failed to survive in the cold Essex clay. And we, we did replanting, we tried, didn't, you know, we tried everything, and then decided that perhaps uh, we needed to rethink it. So we opted to go for Carpinus hornbeam, which is a plant that does well in Essex. And now you can see the hedges have established um, well. This now meant that we had um, an area or space for four gardens, each with their own theme. And we now re refer to these as sort of central campus gardens, and they become an important part of the centre, surrounded by the hostels and a very popular place for people to go. Different theme in each garden, so it doesn't matter which time of year you go to, you will find something of interest um, in those gardens. 1968 saw the 75th anniversary, and local people have told me about some of the celebrations, including folk dancing on the drive on a summer's evening, but as yet no pictures have emerged um, of this, but I have been told about these um, events. More hostel was accommodation was required, and blocks one, two, and three were constructed, and they were later named after Ben Harvey, the first, first post-war principal, but say uh, I can remember these when I first came here as a student being told you're in block two. Um, and as you said, they were very blocky. Uh, but every time a new hostel or a new building goes up, there is an opportunity for new planting, as you can see um, here. The 1950s aerial photograph shows a shrub border along the perimeter of the grounds, as you can see here with very little planting next to the buildings. The architecture of the time was quite stark, so in the 1960s and 70s, John Sales used tree planting to link buildings together um, in the landscape and worked to make the perimeter border much more informal. And the results of this can be seen in the um, aerial photograph. This is 1997, and you can see how very much the buildings are now set within a much more treed uh, landscape. As the planting of the North Lawn has matured, a tra tranquil landscape has evolved. Although the planting here aims to feature ericaceous plants, plants that like a very low pH, the soil is alkaline, and so it has to be uh, required chemical intervention to lower the pH. This was done to ensure the students were introduced to a wide range of plants and was considered quite normal at the time. Today we'd have a different approach and we'd be Using much more emphasis, or placing much more emphasis on right plant, right place. So you you plant with conditions, not try to change the conditions to uh, suit plants. But as I say, um, you can see, for example, um, uh, azaleas and um, heathers. And in fact, the heathers I know were all chosen to be ones that were tolerant of alkaline soils, just giving you that impression of an, uh, an ericaceous um, feeling. We hear much about climate change today and are much more aware of extreme weather events. But the storm of 1987 was a complete surprise and shock. Um, it was devastating at the time, but provided space for new planting. As many of the original trees have been planted at a similar time to each other, they were all at a similar stage of growth. In the longer term, it's much more desirable to have trees of an uneven or more diverse spread of ages. So although we lost a lot of trees, that I, and I do remember coming in the next morning, thinking, you know, would the grounds ever go to look like they had done? In fact, you know, you now look around and think, well, where were these trees? And it has given the opportunity to plant um, many more. In the 1950s, 60s, small flowering cherry trees were a fashionable landscape and garden tree, and the collection was planted in the grounds. Of course, over time, these trees have now become over mature and past their best, and their removal is creating opportunities for new planting, which will add diversity to the 
people's plant collection, both in age and type. And um, hopefully you can work out where you are, those of you who know the So this is the main building frontage here, that's the side, and the library would be in here. And you can see the trees are all looking very, very colourful. Now, the next view is taken from as near as I can the same spot, but you wouldn't believe it necessarily, because it's, it's become so much um, more overgrown. And these cherry trees, as I say, are, are gradually coming. We, are, we have put other flowering trees in, um, but we are now thinking, um, you know, as I say, about spreading uh, ages and types and thinking a little bit more about it. The building program has continued as further residential accommodation teaching buildings have been required. The landscape has had to adapt and accommodate these new developments, and whilst it's meant the loss of some plants and gardens, new opportunities have arisen. And you can see at the top here the fruit farm, uh, just in the process, literally just before it's cleared, and um, Tabor and later Madison hostels were built. And if you ever go and look at this bit, walking around the grounds, you'll notice that there, there is a sort of line of birch trees, and you might wonder why they're, they're not a complete line. That's because when we came to plant them, we found a lot of drains <laughs> and pipes that we didn't know about. And so they're, they're, they're rather dotted down that bit. Uh, in 1990, the grounds were extended into the former orchard land, which provided an opportunity for a different planting style. And there's just the remnant of the beach hedge here. The beach hedge used to go all the way across. And it was in conversation with the, the planners who suggested we take that piece of beach hedge out and extend the grounds around so it started to wrap around the new hostels. Wildflower meadows were planted as part of a research project and an arts collaboration with the mosaic artist and Schwebman Fielding. And if you look in the foyer of this building, if you look, look up into the light well, you'll see the mosaic work around it. And that was done as part and parcel of this um, art in residence. Um, so the, the same sort of pattern, the mosaic of flowers, was seen out in the meadow here. Some of the vestiges of the yeah. earlier land use remained with the uh, original orchard shelter belts along here and some of the original fruit trees. Um, have been retained on the edge. So when you go out into the meadow area, you will see the old fruit trees around the outside, and one or two new fruit trees have been added to it. So in future years, people will know that that was the site um, of part of the orchard. The creation of the reservoir, sorry, reservoir number three, I should say, um, has added another dimension to the landscape. So here we are in construction and there is the Titchmarsh building hiding behind the spoil and that's that view in the spring of this year and you can see now um, an all new area around here so you know, it's it's another opportunity you can't think of it as a threat of loss of landscape but an opportunity for new things to emerge. In 1983 we mark the, uh, the centenary of the institution. Um, this here is the uh, one of the central campus gardens, which is known, known as the centenary garden, and celebrating what was by now known as Riddle College. We've gone through several name changes again, Riddle Agricultural College and then Riddle College by this time. This garden was designed by um, a student, uh, one of our design students, it's based on the theme of the Victorian garden, and the shape of a church interior, as you can see from here. This was an important period um, for the college because in 1992, the Higher Education Act meant that we became an independent uh, organisation, so uh, no longer under Essex County Council, and then became a higher education institution. And big spread in the local paper, um, a little bit about the history of the college and there was a big display in um, County Hall, Summerbourne, lots of different events. So the grounds at Riddle developed and changed over time but much information has been passed on orally and in an anecdotal fashion and once people move on the information is lost. 
So in 2007, uh, a project was begun to create a digital archive and um, to acknowledge it, I was funded through uh, one of our teaching and learning funds here to fund this. And we created a, uh, a database of uh, photographs beginning to gather together information and the idea being to make it a learning resource for students to access. So for example, they could like to start to see how trees grow over time because they're here for maybe a year or three years. But trees grow over 30, 40, 50 years, so they need to know how they, they grow. So this is um, one of our uh, Japanese larch, and you can see planted probably 15, 20 years before that, but 1982. They don't grow very quickly to start with on our soils. Um, you can see 1991, and then again in 2018. I would like to say it's getting not very tall, but much wider. <laughs> um, it's funny, you know, different trees will have different habits, and you, you, by being able to collate these, we can start to look at um, how that is. And the width and the spread that you actually need to allow a tree in the landscape. There are many stories behind plants which we're able to capture. And these particular cedar trees have had a checkered start in life. This includes being run over by a mini, <laughs> being partially uprooted by the 1987 storm, and the crash landing of a hot air balloon which snapped the top out of one of the trees. I'm very pleased I found the photograph because I knew about the story because uh, I was round, uh, but I couldn't find it. And then finally I found the photograph that proved it did actually happen. This meant that a replacement tree had to be um, bought in, so we had to buy in a large tree. Thankfully, the hot air balloon is did, did pay for this. And now you wouldn't know, um, um, unless you go and look underneath and actually compare the size of the trunks, you wouldn't actually know that one tree on the right is much uh, older than the one on the left. But we needed to do that to obviously maintain that symmetry. Work continues um, because obviously it's important we capture current events as well as um, events in the past. And when we first started the, the project, someone said you should make sure you do a, a regular capture from places like Google because that's another way of capturing what, uh, what changes. We're also quite fortunate that every so often there are aerial photographs taken, so this one in 2014, for example. So we can now document that, and it's very useful to put all the different aerial photographs out and suddenly realise what has changed over time. So, um, in 2018, another exciting milestone, Ripple had uh, gained Talk to Green Water in 2015, and in 2016, it became Wigan University College and then celebrated its 125th uh, anniversary. So what of the future then? I'd say the grounds began to be developed 80 years ago, many phases of development since then. Uh, we've got significant resource um, here and there are going to continue to be many changes, whether it be through um, climate change, whether it be through um, needs of different courses, I do remember Professor Alder once said as well, however you develop, do leave room for a space lab. He said you don't know what might be needed in the, in the future. Um, and it might be the impact of pest and disease. Um, who would have thought a few years ago you wouldn't be thinking of putting horse chestnut trees in because of, of disease? And think about box blight. You know, we might have to think about that box hedge in front of the main building. So we can't predict what's going to happen, but we, we might plan for the future. So this is one example here. So this shelter belt that was put in, in when the cabins was first developed, has now matured. As you can see, the trees are large. It's now given us an opportunity to create a new garden underneath. And some of you will know this garden well because it's one you've been involved with. And you know this has now created a whole new area that we can we can develop. So we are lucky, I suppose, we have that. But some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, what's this got to do with a Loch Ness Monster? That was mentioned in the, in the, in 
the spill. So, where does Nessie fit into all of this? So, since I started doing this um, project, if you like, I, I, I originally started, as you might have realised, gathering material on the grounds. But then I seemed to become an unofficial archivist. People started saying, oh, you're doing the archive, would you like? And all sorts of bits and pieces have come my way, including China, book, booklets, plow gold, this is something that used to be produced every year, annual reports, um, all sorts of bits and pieces. But one is a scrapbook of this particular event. And I thought I'd just finish off with this event because it's such an interesting um, little story. So a group of agriculture engineer students decided to do a fundraising activity and they built a model of their idea of Nessie and they took it up to the lock as a publicity stunt and put it into the lock on April the 1st, 1964. They invited the press and they got very good coverage and then their idea was to take it on a tour of the country raising money for their uh, chosen charity. Um, and you can see here the um, Freedom From Hunger campaign was the uh, charity and they, oh, sorry, they even got John Mills who was the chair of the charity to write something for the, their magazine. So here is the, as I said, the giant green dragon with a damsel in its blood-stained jaws passes, passing through the town. Um, so they took this on. To, now this must have taken a huge amount of uh, planning and in the archive we have their timetable where they were going to go from April all the way down to getting to London as you can see here where they're, they're traveling and they had to get permission everywhere they went to take this um, is it not monster but this, this monster uh, <laughs> model on the road and to collect money and so the scrapbook is full of all the letters that they wrote to all the different uh, counties and police forces. I just put this one because I thought New Scotland Yard was quite an interesting one. And uh, I just think it's just such an incredible thing that, the, that they did. And they raised over £3,000, which of course in the 1960s was a significant sum of money. So what I'm trying to do now is to gather together some of these stories and we, we hope working with Mary, we're going to make some of this material available to people so that in the future people can look back and see what we're doing. Of course, I, I can't go the night without mentioning COVID. I mean, that's been another event. And so we've, we've started to collect together the posters, face masks, um, these bits and pieces we'll keep. Um, when we get out our office, we're going to be putting them into, uh, so that, you know, in the future people can look back at some of these um, so what started off as a very small project to collect together a few photographs and a, a few maps of the grounds has sort of mushroomed into a much larger um, project. And now it's the students closing. So thank you for listening. Um, obviously I'm happy to answer any questions, but more importantly, if you've got any material or memories, photographs, or things you think might be useful to add to the archive, uh, please do get in touch. Um, and as I say, I've, I've now become sort of a, a volunteer archivist and happily go through all this material to see what we've got and to see what else we might be able to collect together.